Uh, I do not have slides today, uh, but I, I want to talk about a, a couple of different um, facets around election security. So I, uh, I'm the former commissioner of elections in Virginia, um, also a former registrar in Fairfax County, uh, Virginia. And so I've, I've worked at, um, I worked at all different levels in election administration, actually helping to run elections, being responsible for that. Uh, and so I know there's a big job to do out there uh, when we talk about securing the election process uh, and, and making it more secure. So uh, I'm going to start out with funding. Uh, so when we talk about uh, when we talk about funding, we actually uh, put out, and we'll make sure everybody has a link to this. We uh, in August put out uh, kind of an analysis of what the overall cost is. Uh, over the next five years, we think the overall cost is over the next five years for the entire country to be kind of up to where they need to be on election security. Uh, this isn't like a permanent solution. This is just to get them to where they need to be, right, in terms of the things that Akini talked about, um, you know, having equipment in place that provides a paper record, uh, implementing risk-limiting audits after elections, so securing their statewide databases, uh, right, just these basic things that we need to do. Uh, and so over the next five years, we're really looking at over $2 billion going out uh, to state and local governments, uh, right? There's a need out, that's the need that's out there in terms of uh, doing all these improvements and enhancements. So the funding that Akini's talking about, particularly on the House side, is a good start. Uh, but we know there, right, it's going to be a multi-year effort uh, to get this in place. And so when we're talking about uh, kind of Cost, just so uh, so folks have some sense, kind of what what's needed. Uh, so the so the first thing when we look at uh, kind of state and local election cybersecurity, um, we in a lot of instances are asking um, you know individuals, especially that are uh, in small counties. Right, the majority of election officials uh, in this country actually work in small counties. Right, they're under. Uh, well, well under 250,000 uh, people in, in most counties in the country, uh, right? And so that's the, the universe of election officials we're talking about. And we're, we're asking these folks uh, to put up a defense against nation states that are, um, you know, that have this ongoing effort to disrupt our election processes. That's a big ask, uh, right? And so, uh, so when we're talking about uh, cybersecurity assistance, uh, we're talking about training. Uh, we are talking about um, Illinois has a program that they set up with some of the federal funds that uh, that went out last year. Uh, they call it a Cyber Navigator program, but it's where uh, there is there are kind of state level uh, people that get hired and they go out and they assist counties, uh, you know, individual counties, uh, kind of doing assessments and figuring out what they actually need to do to secure their systems and then helping them get the resources to make those fixes, uh, right? And so that's, um, that's a big piece of that. Uh, and then just, uh, you know, the cost of doing things like securing websites, um, you know, preventing denial of service attacks. Like there's all these things that, uh, that go into that local infrastructure. Uh, and so, you know, we're looking at, you know, I, I talked about the, the $2 billion number. And we're talking about over $800 million just to do that piece of it uh, right over the next five years. Uh, when we look at um, the statewide uh, voter registration system, so the infrastructure that really uh, people depend on for, uh, for voter registration, we're looking at almost 500 million. Uh, most of that goes to replacing outdated systems. The databases that states have in place right now that they depend on for vote, voter registration most of them came online in 2000, between 2004 and 2006. Uh, and so you're looking at systems that really, you know, from a technology standpoint, uh, we're going on, on 15 years uh, and more in some places. Uh, they just were not built uh, with the, you know, to take into account the current uh, kind of threats that we face in the online world. I and mean, you all have probably had, you know, uh, two-factor authentication <laughs> on your Facebook account. You know, and things like that. Uh, we're talking about systems that weren't in, you know, that didn't have any of these things in place 
uh, when they were set up. So in mo it, not mo but in a lot of states, that's going to mean uh, either some significant upgrades uh, or just complete replacement of those systems. Uh, and it does take a while, obviously, to replace a system that's that critical. Um, you know, usually one to three years from the time you start that process to the time you bring a new system online. Um, when we talk about voting machines, uh, we're talking about a little over 700 million to not just replace all of the paperless systems that are left out there. I mean, Akini mentioned there's a number of states that are still primarily using uh, paperless systems. Uh, Keeney mentioned Texas, but we had, uh, if any of you saw in Mississippi, uh, they had a, a runoff election not too long ago, and they had some significant problems with their paperless voting machines where they were, you know, people were trying to select one candidate uh, and the machines were selecting another candidate. Uh, not, not unheard of with these machines, uh, but it's, you know, and so it's a problem. So those machines really need to be replaced. Uh, but in addition to those paperless machines that are out there, we also have a, a large number of jurisdictions that have paper-based equipment uh, that's 15, some cases 20 years old, uh, that also needs to be replaced, right? They have uh, higher failure rates, they don't uh, scam ballots as well as the newer equipment that's out there. Uh, so to get everybody up to, you know, kind of at a baseline, um, to, to have a, a equipment out there that's no older than 10 years old uh, for the 2024 election, we're looking at, you know, 700 uh, plus million dollars. Um, and then post-election audits, we're talking about, this actually is not, you know, when we look at the overall cost, um, Akini mentioned some of the, you know, some of the big benefits to doing the post-election audits and risk limiting audits. Uh, nationwide, we're talking about maybe $20 million a year, right? It's not a huge cost uh, because the idea behind risk limiting audits is that you're not, uh, you're not having to go back and look at every single ballot, right? You're going back and you're looking at a sampling of ballots to say, you know, to have enough confidence to say, hey, the scanners that we have counted these ballots accurately, uh, so we're really confident in the results of the election. or hey, it looks like we had a problem here. We need to hand count these ballots, uh, right? And so, uh, so we're looking at, you know, maybe $20 million a year. Uh, so over the next five years, that's, that's $100 million. Um, so again, we, uh, and I will make sure uh, everybody has a link to this. So it's a blog post on the Brennan Center's website um, that um, lays out all of this uh, in terms of costs and what we need to be doing around election funding. Because uh, the, the thing that we have not done around election funding for a long time uh, is to figure out some way to consistently uh, and adequately fund elections in this country, right? Most of it falls to local governments uh, to figure out how to run elections uh, and do all these things that they need to do. Uh, the federal government, uh, with the exception of funding provided under the Help America Vote Act, has uh, not really put in funding. Uh, at the federal level, uh, and so we're, we're really encouraging and pushing for uh, kind of a long-term solution to the funding issue uh, that, that we have to deal with uh, in elections to keep them secure. Uh, and so uh, in terms of, um, I'll go a little bit more into some of the, the security issues um, that we talked about here. I, I want to, uh, Akini talked a little bit about uh, electronic poll books. Um, and I think the, the document, uh, the Better Safe Than Sorry report uh, that Brennan Center put out uh, last year, I think was circulated. We actually are working on an update, so there'll be an update in advance of, uh, in advance of next year uh, to provide to election officials. Uh, but the idea was, right, Brennan, uh, Brennan Center does a lot of work uh, on the election security front uh, in addition to kind of the federal policy issues, uh, including the funding that we've been working on, uh, kind of the analysis, we've also been trying to do a lot of work with, directly with election officials uh, to promote some of these solutions uh, and to figure out where we can be helpful in the process overall. Uh, so on that front, you know, the Better Safe Than Sorry document was really about uh, focusing on contingency planning, right? So the idea that you know, we're trying to push everybody to do the right thing and do everything they need to do in advance to keep the, uh, the process safe and secure. 
Um, we know despite everybody's efforts, there are going to be occasions where it's just not enough, right? Things just don't go well. Um, I, you know, as com by my first general election in, in Virginia um, as commissioner of elections was a disaster. It was all related to machines down in Virginia Beach. It was like a disastrous day, right, despite all the preparation that had gone into it. Uh, and so we, what we really are pushing election officials to do is to make sure uh, they have appropriate contingency plans in place uh, to deal with uh, when issues do arise, right? So uh, in terms of electronic poll books that Akini mentioned, that's an area that hasn't gotten a lot of attention, uh, but that I think is a, a, you know, is a big vulnerability. And so we have pushed for instance, for people to have paper uh, backups for their poll books, to be able to keep the voting process going uh, on election day, uh, having sufficient provisional ballot materials on hand if there are problems with the list uh, so that people can still cast their ballot and uh, ha you know have time to figure things out, uh, not in the midst of the election if it's a bigger issue. Uh, so all these kind of contingency plans and really saying, hey, election officials, we know you're trying. Uh, we know you're doing all this in terms of prevention. Sometimes things just aren't going to go the way they're supposed to. Here's what you should be doing to prepare for when things just don't go right. Um, and so I really encourage everybody to, to kind of look at that report. Um, and like I said, we'll have a, an update out uh, later this year um, in the lead up to, uh, to 2020 elections uh, to say, hey, here are some additional things. Uh, you know, based on the work everybody's been doing over the past couple of years, um, here are some additional things to take into account uh, as we head into 2020. One of those being a move, uh, Keeney mentioned the ballot marking devices, right? Well, there's been a big move in, in a number of states uh, away from paperless uh, machines, but to kind of wholesale use of ballot marking devices. And so what are the, what are the kind of planning issues around uh, using ballot marking devices as opposed to hand marked paper ballots uh, and things that, that people can do to prepare there. Uh, the other thing uh, that I want to uh, talk about uh, in, in terms of uh, better safe than sorry, but also uh, just kind of contingency planning that uh, Keeney didn't mention a lot, but election night reporting uh, is something that we have looked at. Uh, and that we're encouraging election officials and policymakers to take a look at, right? So this is where you go uh, on election night. Everybody wants to know uh, who won in their state or in their local government, uh, state government elections, right? You all are going to be flooding the Virginia. Uh, <laughs> I can tell you what happens after the poll closes. <laughs> yeah, right, uh, right. So, so all, all the Virginia voters here uh, this November are going to be going to the Department of Elections website. Uh, and and like clicking furiously to get updates uh, as to what's going on in different races, uh, right? And so that's a vulnerability. Uh, those systems, the concern there is uh, not so much. I mean, those are unofficial results, right? They there's a whole process that goes into uh, formalizing results and certifying them. Uh, but it's really the perception issue, and I think this will, uh, you know, David's going to talk to us more about kind of the, the voter side and the, the kind of voter suppression work and the uh, kind of all that host of related issues. But, but in terms of confidence, right, the fact that if you go to bed uh, and the results say one thing and you wake up the next morning and they are the complete opposite, what, what right, what does that do overall to, <laughs> uh, right, what does that do overall to confidence levels if there's these big swings that are unexplainable on these websites? And so getting people to take a look at that. Uh, the other thing that uh, Brendan Center has been focused on uh, and we're trying to put more focus on uh, going forward are uh, private vendors that are working in the election space. Uh, so from a uh, security standpoint, right, uh, election officials uh, overall depend pretty heavily on private election vendors. So whether that be the people that sell you the voting machine, that do ballot programming, that do training for folks, there are a host of things that uh, private vendors do. And those folks, there's like zero regulation, zero uh, accountability in place for those vendors. All right, and so a lot of the federal legislation that you've been looking at um, uh, is, is trying to take a look at how do we bring accountability um, to that other component of election administration, which are these private vendors uh, that, um, you know, 
can ensure things like uh, that they're adequately screening staffers, uh, that they don't have foreign ownership. We had a problem in Maryland uh, last year where a, uh, the vendor that was uh, housing their statewide registration system, uh, unknown to Maryland, was partially owned uh, by a fund that's run by uh, associate of Vladimir Putin, right? So, uh, so you have this Russian oligarch who has this fund that is uh, purchased now a company that uh, that houses a statewide registration system, right? And so, uh, so this came to life in Maryland, acted very quickly to shift away and go to another vendor. But um, there are no requirements in place, right? That these things be disclosed. Uh, things like foreign ownership be disclosed. Uh, and so looking at some of these issues that can bring uh, transpa more transparency to the process, uh, more accountability to election vendors uh, as we go through that. Um, so those are some of the issues that elect uh, or the Brennan Center is, is working on. Um, I'll mention uh, in closing the kind of post-election audits. Uh, we've been doing a lot of work around post-election audits. Uh, going out and working with local election officials to actually get them to pilot uh, risk limiting audits and to work with states on figuring out how to implement these uh, statewide. So we actually uh, have partnered with them and we will help bring in uh, both the academics, the technology vendors that help with uh, kind of taking the complicated math that the academics come up with as to how many ballots to look at and uh, which ballots to look at. Uh, you know, there are some vendors that, that take that and convert it to easy to use technology so election officials can figure out how to do that. Uh, so we kind of bring all these folks together uh, with, at no cost to the election officials, right, and sit with them and help them uh, figure out how these processes are going to work um, and, and what it's going to look like uh, to get them to understand that Number one, this isn't as big a lift as you think it is, uh, right? Because it sounds really scary when you talk about having to do a, uh, something else after an election uh, before you certify it. Uh, so it's not as big a lift as you think it is, uh, but also there's a lot of benefits to it, right? And so we have uh, been doing that work in Michigan. We started last year in Michigan uh, with, I think, three counties. Uh, Michigan is getting ready uh, in 2020 to do their first statewide uh, risk limiting audit after the presidential primary, right? So we made a lot of progress. So, uh, so we've been going kind of in different states working uh, in that method with uh, election officials directly. So those are kind of some of the ways that the Brennan Center uh, has been trying to tackle uh, the issue of election security <coughs> is really, you know, we have the kind of federal uh, policy focus, um, uh, kind of information and research that we've been putting out, and then also kind of direct work with uh, election officials to uh, to put some of these things into place, these recommendations that we have come up with after a lot of uh, research and analysis and working with folks across the country uh, to actually put them into action uh, and, and use them to improve the security of elections. So that's the, the work Brennan Center has been doing. Um, so I'll end with that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great.